Which aspects of microbial diversity can we measure by 16S sequencing? First, I'd like to tell you about Tolstoy's paradox. Suppose the base coil error rate is about 0.5%, which is typical for Illumina after stringent quality filtering. How many of the sequences in the reads are correct? Here we are counting unique sequences, so if the same sequence appears several times, we count it only once. The surprising answer is only around 2%. In other words, something like 98% of the sequences in your reads are wrong. How is this possible? Choosing some round numbers, suppose the read length is 100 nucleotides and 0.5% of the base calls are wrong, then there's one wrong letter out of every 200 and half the reads have bad sequences. Notice that the error rate per read is 100 times greater than the error rate per base. Now consider what happens if there are 100 reads of the same species. Remember that half the reads are correct, and these will all have the same sequence. However, the incorrect reads will have different random errors. We can visualize this using a diagram where dots are sequences and the size of each dot represents abundance. As we generate more reads, one high abundance correct sequence is surrounded by an error cloud of incorrect sequences with low abundance. So after we're done sequencing, we'll have one correct sequence and 50 incorrect sequences. Therefore, approximately 1 in 50, or 2% of the sequences are correct. So apparent diversity always increases as we add more reads, because all happy reads are alike, while each unhappy read is unhappy in its own way. Those round numbers were over-optimistic. These days we get 200 to 300 letters per read, or per read pair, which gives two to three times more errors per sequence. Also, sequencing error is not the only problem. There are also errors due to PCR, such as chimeras, and crosstalk, where reads are assigned to the wrong sample due to barcoding errors. One approach to solving this problem is to cluster the reads into OTUs. But unfortunately, most OTU clustering algorithms don't work well in practice. They generate many completely spurious OTUs which contain only bad sequences. Because of these effects, even if errors are rare as a fraction of the base calls, many or even most of the OTUs can be bad. Some well-known software packages have problems with this. For example, for several years, the recommended OTU method in Chime was called open reference clustering. This method generates hundreds or thousands of bad OTUs on mock community tests and probably on real samples also. You can read more about this in my PRJ paper shown here. Now you may be thinking that these problems are well known and they have been solved. It's true that state-of-the-art algorithms, including UPARs for 97% ODUs, and denoises such as Data2 and UNOISE, do a good job of removing sequencing and PCR error. However, none of these algorithms address crosstalk, and all of them discard low abundance sequences. Let's look at what happens in more detail. A typical species abundance distribution is J-shaped, with the J lying on its side. When we sequence this distribution, we get some valid sequences and some error clouds. If we keep the low abundance sequences, then we may, may see greatly exaggerated diversity due to errors. On the other hand, if we use a method like UPARS, DATA2, or UNOISE, which gives us good sequences, then we may be discarding a long tail of valid species along with the errors. Either way, it's obvious that you can't measure richness, which is the number of species or OTUs in your sample. And it's also obvious that you can't use estimators such as Chow1 to extrapolate to the full diversity of the ecosystem, 
because these estimators need reliable abundances of detected rare species. Rarefaction analysis plots the number of species or OTUs against the number of observations, which in this case is the number of reads. The idea is that when all species have been observed, then the curve will flatten out into a horizontal line. In traditional biodiversity analysis, we don't have to worry about experimental error in the observations, and this works fine. However, with next generation sequencing, we have a big problem with errors, and this gives us two choices. Keep the low abundance sequences, which may cause many bad OTUs, or discard low abundance sequences, which may discard many valid, sequ uh, many valid species. If we keep the low abundance sequences, then the measured diversity will continue to increase because of errors, regardless of how many reads we make. On the other hand, if we discard low abundance sequences to keep the number of bad OTUs at a reasonable level, then the curve always appears to flatten out. There's no middle ground between these two choices because it's impossible to reliably detect the bad sequences. And this means that rarefaction analysis cannot tell you anything useful about your 16S data. Clearly, we can't measure richness. However, most other alpha diversity metrics, such as Shannon ent entropy, are calculated from frequencies, where low frequency OTUs have a lower, a lower weight. So these metrics are less sensitive to the long tail of low abundance OTUs, which are a mix of errors and rare species. Now you may be thinking that we're in good shape because the higher frequencies are pretty good. But unfortunately not, we can't measure frequencies either. Now we run into problems due to gene copy number and primer mismatches. Prokaryotes often have several copies of the 16S gene. For example, E. coli has seven copies, H. pylori has two copies, Bacillus cereus has 16 copies, and Bacillus mycoides has just one copy. As you can see, the 16S copy number varies by a factor of 10 or more, even within a single genus, as the Bacillus examples show. Mismatches between the gene and your PCR primers reduces amplification efficiency. As a rule of thumb, you'll get something like 30 times fewer reads for each mismatched position. With commonly used primers, around 10% of species have at least one mismatch. Obviously, if, the, if there are more copies of the gene, then you get more reads. And if there are primer mismatches, you get fewer reads. Unfortunately, you can't adjust read counts to get accurate frequencies because there's too much variation in closely related species, so you can't use databases of known species to look up the correction factor. There are some published methods that claim to do this, but unfortunately their benchmark tests are not realistic, and in fact they do not work. Here is an example from real data. The top histogram shows the true frequency distribution of species measured using shotgun sequencing. The bottom histogram is the frequency distribution measured by 16S reads. The distributions look very different, and the correlation between the true and measured frequencies is very weak. If you can't measure frequencies, then there are some basic questions that you cannot answer. For example, you cannot determine the dominant OTU. As this example shows, the most abundant species in the sample may not be the most abundant species in the reads. In typical studies, each sample is amplified in a separate PCR reaction with a barcode sequence embedded in the primer. If there's a read error in the barcode, then the read will not be assigned to the correct sample. Suppose we use a four nucleotide barcode to multiplex 128 samples and 0.5% of the barcode bases are wrong. Then 2% of the reads will be assigned to the wrong sample. It's very challenging to measure cross crosstalk in practice, but I believe this number is in the typical range for multiplexed amplicon sequencing. 
Crosstalk creates its own fundamental problems in 16S analysis. Suppose OTU123 is a pathogen which causes the disease you are studying. All samples from sick patients contain, contain high frequencies of OTU123, and all samples from healthy controls do not. What happens when we multiplex these samples and sequence them? Crosstalk from sick samples into healthy samples may cause OTU123 to be present in most or all of the healthy samples. The rate of crosstalk between two given samples will have large variations depending on the number of differences between their barcode sequences, which means that it's not possible to filter crosstalk by setting a minimum abundance. Therefore, with multiplexed reads, you cannot determine whether a given, a given OTU is present or absent, and it's hard or impossible to identify a core microbiome of OTUs that are present in most samples, because OTUs with high abundance in a few samples will tend to be seen everywhere. You can read more about amplification biases and crosstalk in these papers. Unfortunately, the problems with measuring diversity by 16S sequencing are not well known in the field, and many, if not most, published papers report questionable results. Here's a typical, a typical results section. They report richness. They generate rarefaction curves. They extrapolate richness using the ACE estimator. They calculate the dominance index, which is based on the frequency of the most abundant OTU. None of these can be measured using 16S data, but the paper fails to consider these problems. As we've seen, traditional, me traditional methods for measuring the diversity within a sample simply don't work. To address this, I developed octave plots in collaboration with my Danish colleague Henrik Flubier. These are histograms of OTU abundance distributions similar to Preston plots in traditional ecology, with added features to account for errors and biases due to PCR and sequencing. They provide an effective alternative to rarefaction for judging how much of the total diversity has been sampled and can also reveal outliers such as infection and spurious apparent diversity due to crosstalk, chimeras, and other errors. I don't have time to describe octave plots in detail. You can read the paper if you're interested in learning more. While you can't measure the diversity of a single sample, it's often reasonable to compare the alpha diversities of sample groups. This is a valid procedure if the systematic errors and biases are consistent across different samples, which is typically the case if all samples were sequenced in the same run. Groups are defined by labeling samples with metadata such as healthy and sick or wet and dry. A rank sum test can be used to see if one group tends to have higher or lower diversity than another group. In usearch, this is done with the alpha div sig command. One pitfall to watch for is checking several different metrics to see if one of them gives a low p-value, for example, testing both richness and Shannon entropy. If you do this, then you should apply the Bonferroni multiple test correction. While this approach seems reasonable, it's still subject to systematic errors which are not well understood. This means that it's not possible to get robust p-values and therefore, this methodology should be viewed as generating plausible hypotheses rather than well-tested conclusions. To increase confidence in your analyses, I suggest uh, trying different OTU methods and checking whether they give consistent results. So which OTU methods should you use? Here are the most important criteria for choosing an OTU method. How accurate are the OTU sequences? How many of the OTUs are valid rather than experimental error? How many low abundance sequences are discarded? And how does the method scale to many samples and many reads? There are currently only three methods which consistently have highly accurate sequences on mock community test. The denoises, data2 and unoise, 
and the UPaaS algorithm for generating 97% OTUs. UNoise and UPaaS are implemented in the USearch package. USearch has much better scaling and is much faster than other methods. This gives you the ability to combine all reads from a data set and cluster them together. Sequence abundances are, are determined across the entire data set rather than individual samples. UPaaS discards singletons per data set and UNoise discards, discards sequences with abundances less than eight per, uh, eight per data set while Data2 discards sequences with abundance uh, less than four per sample. This means that in most cases, Data2 is much less sensitive to, to low abundance uh, species. I believe that the best approach is to analyze diversity using both UPaaS and UNoise and check if the results are consistent. UNoise has the advantage that it's more sensitive to closely related species but this comes at the expense of being less sensitive to low abundance species. On the other hand, UPaaS is more sensitive to low abundance species, but may lump closely related species together into the same OTU.